so that we can uh, continue uh, with our our service this morning I'd like to first start by wishing all our mothers a happy happy mother's day may you be spoiled by those uh, you are with and, and and you are such an integral part of our lives and we'd like to thank god for you and um, just because before we start i want us to go to our father in prayer and, and I want you, brethren, wherever you are, to remember our, our students at this time who, who are at home and who are also expected to continue with their studies at home. And some have expressed difficulties uh, in doing so. And so they've asked me to, to remember them in, in my prayer this morning. Uh, to all our students, we miss you. And, and, and we, we want you to know that we are praying for you. We want you to know wherever you are, that you are, you are, you are uppermost in our, in our prayer life. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you this morning for, for your love. We thank you, Father, for, for Jesus Christ and what he means to us. We also thank you, O oh Lord, for for the privilege that we have to call you our Father. We know when we say Abba Father to you, we are able, Father God, to communicate with you. Our Lord, we also thank you for the privilege of, of being a member of the Church of Christ. Our Father, it's such a huge honor for us to be part of the body of Christ, the body of the elect, the body of those whose names are written in the books of life. Father, we thank you for the fellowship that we have, Father God, e even though we are not able to meet physically, but we know we are one and we are together in spirit. Father, I'm, I'm mindful this morning of our students who, who are faced with a mammoth task, Father God, of continuing with their studies under this, this lockdown. Father, I pray a special blessing upon them. I pray, Father God, that you may bless them 
during this time with strength and with wisdom, Father, so that they may be able to do so. O oh Lord our God, how excellent is your name. You are greater and your name is above every other name, Father. And Father, we know that this name is the only name that we have been given so that man might be saved with, Father. And Father, we thank you also for the, for the opportunity that we have this morning of, of sharing your word and and of, of partaking of it and, and meditating on it this morning, Father. Father, I believe there are so many uh, wise things that we can extrapolate from your word, Father. And, and I would like to uh, thank you for the privilege that you gave me, Father, so that I may be able, Father, to impart your wisdom with your children. Father, we pray that it might be done with, with all sincerity, with all power, and with all wisdom that comes from you, Father. Father, we pray that you open our hearts. We pray that you open our minds, Father, so that we can be receptive to your word. Father, we are also mindful of those among us who, who are struggling with various ailments, Father. I pray for them and I ask you, Lord, to be with them, Father, and help them during this difficult time, Father, that they may be able, Lord, to trust in you and continue to put their trust in you. For, for you are able to keep for us that which we have entrusted until that day. Oh Lord, we thank you for all this and more. We ask you uh, all this in the name of our wonderful Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's also uh, uh, one of those uh, days where we have to examine the word of God and see what the Lord has in store for us today. To today, I want us to... Um, look at the message that comes from the book of Acts chapter 27. This is where we will be reading this morning. Uh, and and, and I'm, I want us to go there uh, with the title that says, If God said it, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. Uh, it, it settles it. Whatever God says will happen will happen. It doesn't matter if we believe it or not. Of course, ideally, we, we ought to believe everything that proceeds from the word of God. But, but, but there are times when we doubt, there are times when we find ourselves in, in the middle of the storm and, and, and it's difficult to believe uh, what God says even in the midst of the storm. So, so, so our title uh, is from uh, the book of Acts chapter chapter 27 and, and, and this is a very I interesting time indeed because Paul here is, is, is an awaiting trial prisoner and, and, and Paul being an awaiting trial prisoner, he, he was in Jerusalem and, and he was supposed to be tried there in Jerusalem but the Apostle Paul uh, through the wisdom that God gave, gave him, he decides he, he is not going to be tried in Jerusalem because his trial might be prejudiced by the Jews. The Jews will not give him a fair trial. No wonder he opts to use and invoke his rights as a Roman citizen in order for, for, for him to launch his appeal with Caesar in Rome. So, so the Apostle Paul is, 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 is planning a journey, a, a very long journey uh, uh, from, from Jerusalem into into Rome and and the aim of that journey is precisely to to appeal to Caesar because you'd remember the apostle Paul was a Roman citizen and so he he, he wants to to get a fair trial and, and and he he figures out that the only way he can be able to get a fair trial is if he goes to Rome and 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 present his case uh, be, before Caesar and, and, and I, I actually like the fact that he starts on, on this journey with other prisoners. And, and not only the prisoners, but we see in verse 1 that there was a centurion. A centurion is the leader of, of a thousand army who was tasked to guard Paul and other prisoners as they will be going to uh, to, to, to Caesar uh, to present their trial. And, and this is a very interesting 
a journey uh, indeed. Uh, and we see in, in, verse, in verse 9, uh, I want to read verse 9, it says, When considerable time had passed, the voyage was now becoming dangerous. Uh, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them. O on their way to Rome, Paul realizes that it, it's, it's probably not the best thing to do in order to, to travel to Rome at this time because it was a winter season and, and it, was, it was becoming too turbulent and, and, and it was becoming unsafe for them to travel to Rome. But, but I, like, I like what the Apostle Paul says. He warns these guys. He warns the, 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 the centurion and he warns his fellow inmates not to continue with the trip to Rome. And I like what he says also in verse 10. And he said to the men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be dangerous. Voyage is a long journey that you take through a ship. The Apostle Paul, with the wisdom that God gives him, figures out that it will be a dangerous mission to continue with, with the trip. He says they will suffer damage and they will suffer a great loss, not only of the cargo, but also the ship and their their own lives and 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 and, and it's interesting to 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 see what what these guys say in response to the apostle paul instead of taking the apostle paul's advice instead of taking the the advice of the servant of god look at what the people do in verse 11 but the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. What a tragedy uh, it is to, to, to read that they did not listen to what the servant of God said to them. They did not listen to the warning that the servant of God gave them. And, and, and you see when God's servants give us a warning and, and like I am doing, like other servants are, 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 are warning us, we need to give heed because whatever they say, if it is from the word of God, it will happen exactly as they said it will happen. But the people do not give heed. They don't believe it. And, and, and they decide to listen rather to the experts. They decide to listen to the captain of the ship and the pilot. In verse 12 we see because uh, the, the harbor was not suitable for wintering, uh, the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from from there. Instead of listening to the servant of God, that the captain and the centurion listened to the experts and the majority. You see, brethren, one of the things that I've learned in my short span of life that God has given me is that sometimes the majority can be wrong. And in this instance, we see the centurion listening to the majority and they make a majority decision. I always say to my fellow hilltoppers uh, at Hilltop, and I miss you guys, and I always tell you that sometimes the majority can be wrong, and, and the majority in particular that does not have God with them. We, we usually say at Hilltop, the majority without God is a minority, and a minority with God is he is a majority. So Paul is in the minority, but because he is with God, because he's, he's instructed by God, he is in the majority. I, I, I like what happens next. Exactly what Paul said will happen it is beginning to happen. When, when you read uh, verse 14, we see that, but before very long, there rushed down from the land a violent wind. Before very long, having warned them that that the trip is going to be dangerous, having warned them that it is going to be turbulent wherever they are going, it happens exactly how 
he had predicted. That is why the, 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 the title of my, my sermon this morning, uh, if God said it, if his servants said it, it doesn't matter if the centurions believe it or not. It doesn't matter whether the majority believe it or not. It doesn't matter whether the captain of the ship with all his experience, with all his wisdom, it, it doesn't matter if they believe it or not. It will happen exactly as God had predicted it, it will happen. And, and we see that before very long, they rushed down from the land a violent wind called you, you rock. Uraculo. And, and, and when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, verse 15, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. Brethren, if we would not listen to, to, to the servants of God, if we would not listen to the word of God, we will find ourselves caught up. We will find ourselves in situations that spiral out of control. And here we see people uh, caught up in a storm. We see people caught up in a situation that spirals out of, out of their control. But I like what happens in verse, verse 20. Since the sun nor the star appeared for many days and no small storm was assailing us from then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. Look, look at what is happening here, church. Look, look at what is beginning to happen. They, they are caught up in a storm. And, and, and what I've noticed about storms is that the longer you are caught up in a storm, the, 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 the likely it, it is for you to begin to lose hope. You see, it's one thing to be caught up in a storm for a week. It, it's one thing to be caught up in a storm for two weeks. It, it's another to be caught up in a storm for a month or two like we have been caught up in this in this COVID-19 storm and, and the longer you are caught up in a storm it, it is natural for you to begin to lose hope it, it is natural for you to begin not to see your way out of the storm it, it's natural for us as God's people the longer we find ourselves in a storm to, 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 to begin not to see how we will survive past this storm. And, and we are told here that the people are beginning to doubt whether they will get out of this situation alive. Maybe in the first week of our COVID-19 we still had hope. We still had hope that maybe our businesses will, will, will wither the storm. But, but, but immediately when we get to day 40 something we, some of us are beginning to doubt whether our businesses will wither the storm. Storm. Maybe in our first week of these COVID-19 storms, we, 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 we were still having hope that, that we will get out of this unscathed. But the longer the storm, the likely our hope is to dwindle. The likely it is for us to begin to lose hope. Are you losing hope wherever you are? I've got news for you. When you read verse 20, when you read verse 21, when you read verse 22, that the very same apostle that they didn't listen to, he is beginning to see that people are beginning to lose hope and he stands up in their midst and listen to what the apostle Paul is saying to them. In verse 22, he says, to them, of course, in verse 21, he was quick to tell them, I told you so. If you don't listen to God, if you do not listen to his servant, you are bound to be in a storm. But, but I like what he says, and, and, and I believe we need to appropriate this message. Those of us who are beginning to lose hope, those of us who are beginning to lose hope, listen to what the Apostle Paul is saying to us this morning. He says, yet I edge you to keep your courage. I urge you to keep your courage. 
I, I, I am pleading with you, Hiltopas, in the midst of this storm that we find ourselves in, in, in the midst of this prolonged situation that we find ourselves in, that, that yes, there are things we are going to lose. Yes, there, there are things that, that, would, that would not be kept by us because in every storm there is always a casualty. But I urge you, my fellow Hiltopas, to keep the courage. I urge you, my fellow Kiltopas, to keep the faith. Yes, we might lose uh, uh, in their instance or in their case, they lost the boat. In their instance, they lost their sheep. Listen to what the Apostle Paul is saying in verse 23. For this very night, an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong, whom I serve, stood before me, saying, do not be afraid. Paul, you must stand before Caesar and behold God granted you all those who are sailing. Therefore keep up your courage man for I believe that God eh, eh, it, things will happen exactly as God had said it will happen but we must run aground on a certain island. Actually in verse 20, 22 he says no one is going to lose their lives but only the sheep will be lost. So, so why should we, we remain courageous, brethren? We need to remain courageous. We need to keep the faith. Even though we might lose certain things. Even though in the midst of this storm, it's possible for us to lose our modes of transport. In this instance, they lost their sheep. They lost the only mode of transport that they had. Maybe it might happen to us too. For us us to lose our modes of transport but God is still requiring us to keep the faith you, you see storms have 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 a way of of reminding us of of what is important you listen to what the apostle Paul is saying the apostle Paul is saying the most important thing you will keep which is your life the most important thing you will keep which is your courage but you will lose the the sheep that you have. You will lose the, the, the boat that you have. And, and, and so I, I, want to, I want to encourage you this morning. May, may we remain courageous even during the midst of this storm. May we remain uh, uh, where God left us. Let us keep the courage. Let us keep the, the, the faith that we have. Hey, you, you can lose things, but do not lose your faith. You can lose cars, but do not lose your faith because your faith is that thing that will help you to wither or to go beyond and transcend the storm that you find yourself in you know you know you know this is very interesting because listen to what the apostle paul is saying the apostle paul is saying it is god who's going to spare their lives but he will allow the sheep to be lost to them. He will allow the sheep to be lost to them. It, 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 this reminds me of, of, of the book of Job. You, you see, God says to Satan, Satan, have you seen my servant Job? There is no one who is as faithful as he is. And, and God continues to say to Satan, eh, 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 you, 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 you know, he is very faithful. And Satan says to God, the reason why he is faithful is because you have put a hedge around him. You have protected whatever he has. And, and God response to him he says you can take all these things that he has but do not touch his soul do not touch his soul you, you can take these things. You, you, you see, I, I've been wondering, the more I think about this scripture, the, the more I think about this shipwreck that, that is happening here, why did God save their lives and not save their sheep. I think, like he said in the book of Job, you see, God knew that they might lose the sheep, but they might recover it later. But their lives, 
they will not recover. There are certain things that we need to keep whenever we are in the storm. Yes, we might lose our businesses. Yes, we might lose our cars. Yes, we might lose material things. But those things we can always recover. Yes, it might take us long. It might take us long to recover them. But guess what? Recovering them, we will recover. But if we lose our lives, if we do not submit to our governments during this time, and we lose our lives, we might not be able to, to recover them. And if we lose things and, and, and keep our lives, chances of recovering these things are very high. I, I like what another author was saying uh, by the name of Sarah. He says the reason why God allowed the sheep to be to be aground to to be wrecked listen to what he, she says she says the reason why god allowed the sheep to to be wrecked by the storm is so that he can remind us of what is important what are the sheep that you 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 are, you are, you are going to lose what what are the sheep that you have continued to lose during this COVID-19. Some of us, it's relationships. It is toxic relationships that we have. What are some of the ships that you might lose this morning? Maybe some of us is our unhealthy relationship uh, with, with, with material things. What are some of the things that we stand to lose or that we might lose as a result of this COVID-19? Maybe some of us it is our unhealthy relationship to, 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 to these adversities addictive things that we have taken. You see, maybe some of us will learn for the first time that all we have all along was God. You will never realize what that God is all you have until God you are left with. So God here makes it possible for them to be left with him and their lives. And these other ships are wrecked as a result of this storm. So what are some of the things that 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 we, we we might lose during this time? I'm here to tell you keep the faith. Do not lose the faith. You might lose things, but do not lose the faith. You might lose things, but keep your faith. These other things might be wrecked in your life, but do not allow a shipwreck of your faith. In every storm there are casualties. What are some of the casualties that we might lose? Are we going to lose our, keep the important things. Keep your faith. Keep your courage. Keep your marriages. Keep your, 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 your resolve and your trust in God. We, we might lose these other things, but let's not allow us to lose God. That is the first point I want to make this morning. The, 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 the other point that I want to make is, is that storms have a funny way of taking us where we did not intend to go. You remember the Apostle Paul had intended to go to Rome from Jerusalem. But look at where this storm uh, ends up leading him. He, he finds himself in chapter 28. He is in an island called Malta. He, he finds himself in a place Place that he did not intend to go to. You see, storms number one not only reminds us of what is important, that life is important, that our faiths are more important than the things we have, because our lives do not consist in the abundance of our wealth. But number two, storms have a way of taking us to places we never thought we could be. Look, the Apostle Paul is moving from Rome, from Jerusalem, intending to go to, to Rome. But where does he land? He finds himself in Malta. I, I want to say to you this morning, may, maybe after this COVID-19, you will find yourself in a place that you did not intend to, la to land in. Maybe, maybe this storm will, will, will take you to places you never intended to be in. But, but, but nonetheless, uh, be that as it may, we must still keep 
the faith. We see the Apostle Paul keeping the faith. Actually, the Apostle Paul is, is hosted when he gets to Malta by an official there in Malta, a very important official in Malta who hosts the Apostle Paul. And we are told that this official's name was Publius. When you read uh, Acts chapter 28 verse 7, now in the neighborhood of that place where the lands belonging to the leading men of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us cautiously for three days. Here's the Apostle Paul. He gets to Malta and he finds an important official. He doesn't sulk. He doesn't say, because I am not where I intended to be, I'm going to sulk. I'm going to resent God. Instead, he, he finds himself being hosted by this man. And in verse 7, we see in verse 8 that it happened that this man's father was sick and lying in bed, afflicted by fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to see him. And after he had prayed, he laid hands on him and healed him. Paul does not conduct a pity party when he gets to Malta. He doesn't throw his hands on the air and, and resent God. Instead, he continues to bloom wherever God has planted him. Where will God plant me? Where, where, where will God plant you? Where will this storm lead us? Maybe it might not lead you where you thought you will be in, 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 in after the, 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 the storm. It might land you in a place where you never thought you would be. But wherever it will land you, God's people continue to praise God. Continue to do the work of God. Continue to bloom wherever you are planted. So what is your Malta this morning? Well, what is that place that you find yourself in that you never anticipated you could be there? Maybe some of us thought by now I would be flying to Europe. By now I would be in this place and in that place. But you are not there. And, and that is your Malta. The place that you find yourself in that you never thought you could be. What is your Malta this morning? My Malta is that I never thought that this day I will be sitting in, standing in front of you in the comfort of my house and preaching the gospel. I, I, my matter is that I never thought and, and even dreamed that this year, for the first time, I will be preaching on, on DSTV, preaching the gospel there. I thought by this time I would be at Hilltop Church of Christ preaching the gospel. But God allowed this storm to happen so that he can lead me where he wanted me to be. So I want to encourage you this morning that wherever you are going to find yourselves in after this storm, that is where God wanted you to be. If he allowed it, he, he has a purpose with it. And we see God continuing to have a purpose with the life of, of Paul, even when Paul was in a place that he did not intend to be. Let us not resent God because we find ourselves in places where we never intended to be. Let's continue to praise God. Let's continue to work in his vineyard. Bloom wherever God plants you. It might not be a place where you wanted to go, but you are there. <laughs> you might as well make the most of the, 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 the opportunity that God has, has, has put you in. The, the other thing that I want to say before I close is that sometimes this place of vulnerability that you might find yourself in might be a place where you will get your greatest breakthrough. Paul gets his greatest breakthrough in Malta, a place that he never thought he could be at. So what is your Malta this morning? What, what, what is that place that you finding yourselves in? That, that, is, that is anxiety provoking, that scares you. Because you never, maybe some of us here I, I, I find themselves in a situation where they will have to move away from, from formal employment and be self-employed. And, and it, it can be anxiety provoking, but I want to encourage you to keep the faith, to continue trusting in God. Maybe that place of 
your greatest vulnerability is the place where you are going to experience your greatest breakthrough. I'm seeing God uh, doing wonderful things through me at this time, even though I am finding myself in a place where I never thought I would be. And, and for those who know me better, uh, I want to talk to you, uh, uh, people like Brother Marubini, you know how much uh, technology uh, frightens me. I'm finding myself in, in my Malta where I, I find myself in a situation where I have to use technology. I have to use these gadgets in order to preach the gospel. Is it scary? Yes, it is scary for me. But I, am, I have decided to make the most of the place where God has put me. God has a purpose with our lives. Sometimes God's purpose is not where you thought you were, it is. Maybe your purpose is in Malta. Because clearly God had a purpose for Paul. So do not lose your faith. Do not look at your life and, and think because I am where I did not think I will be, it is over. It is not over until God says it is over. The last thing I want to address this morning is that I hear many people looking at COVID-19 and saying, and maybe this is the end of the world. Maybe, maybe this is the end of, of the world. But I'm going to tell you that it is not the end of the world. These two will pass. But justice, how can you say this too will pass. I'm saying this too will pass because God said so. God did not say COVID-19 is going to be to end the world. God said it's only fire that is going to burn all the elements of this world. And those of us who are still alive will be caught up in the air with the saints as Christ comes back and takes the church. What, what, what confidence do I have that COVID-19 is not the end of us? The confidence that I have lies in the scripture. Matthew 24, the book of Thessalonians, tell us that COVID-19 is not the way we're going to end. You know, maybe some might lose their lives. Maybe some might be casualties, but not all of us would lose uh, our lives. So these two, church, will pass. These two will pass. If it doesn't pass and it stays with us, I don't believe that it is going to be the end of our lives uh, as we know it. Yes, some of us might lose our lives, but not all of us can lose our lives. So what have we learned this morning? Number one, we have learned that the longer the storm prolongs, the more likely it is for us to begin to lose hope, to begin to despair even of life itself. And so Paul is encouraging all of us this morning that yes, we might lose things as a result of this prolonged um, prolonged storm that we find ourselves in. We might lose what? Things. And, and as, as we know, as God's people, we know that our lives does not consist in the abundance of things. It's not things that hold our lives. There is more to us as God's people than the things we, we have. Uh, and so wherever God is going to lead you, which is the second point, uh, wherever God is going to lead you, do not sulk, do not resent him, but bloom wherever he's going to lead you. Maybe he will, he will not lead you to Malta like he led Paul. Maybe to you, your Malta is starting your own business because the things we lose, uh, God knows we will recover them. That is why I want to encourage you, keep your faith. Do not lose your faith. You may lose things, but do not lose your faith. May the reading of his word uh, be, we may we thank God and bless God for the reading of his word. Amen. Now I'm going to proceed uh, to our Lord's Supper this morning. And our Lord's Supper will come uh, from a, a very interesting passage. It comes from uh, the book of First Corinthians chapter 1 uh, from verse 18 until verse 19. I want to give you time to collect your emblems so that you may partake 
of these emblems. When you read verse 18, it says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Last week, I spoke about uh, the, the, the importance of Christ uh, dying in the cross. We, we, we explored the fact that Christ could not die in just about any other way, but he had to die in the cross so that he can appropriate our sins because God wanted to make him sin so that we can be made the righteousness of God and, and and so that was the only way God could save us that was the way that God chose in order to save us and that is the message that we preach we preach Christ crucified and and, and, and though we preach Christ crucified we are aware that to those who are in the church whenever we preach Christ crucified it is power it is the power of God Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of the cross. I am not ashamed of the message of the cross. For it is the power of God to those who are being saved. Uh, but to those who are perishing, the same message that I am preaching every Sunday, the message of the cross, it's foolishness. Paul here was talking about his setup. He found himself in a setup where uh, the majority of, his, of the people he was addressing in Corinth were, were Greeks. And as we know, Greeks, Greeks believe in philosophy. They believe in understanding the meaning of life. They, begin, they believe in, in understanding who God is, you know. And, and, and their hope is that if I understand the meaning of life, if I understand God, then whatever I understand, I will be able to control. And, and so, so, so Paul is preaching the gospel of the cross to such people. And Paul was also preaching the message of the cross to the Jews, to his fellow Jews. And, and, and it was not palatable to the Jews because to a Jewish person, to a Jewish scholar, uh, the cross is a place of shame. The cross is a place of humiliation. And so they, they struggled to, 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 to identify with these teachings because their idea of a Messiah is not someone who was going to die in the cross. No wonder when Jesus was in the cross, they kept on saying, if you are the son of God, Take yourself out of the cross. If you are who you claim to be, you cannot be lying in the cross. You cannot be lying in, in, a, in a beam of shame. But take yourself. No wonder they rejected this gospel. They rejected the idea that from a cross can come a hope. They rejected the idea. The Jews rejected the idea that from a cross can come a message of hope. From a cross can come salvation because the Jews looked at the cross as a place of shame, as a place of humiliation. And so Paul is writing to the Christians in, in Corinth and he's saying this message that we preach, the message of the cross, to us it is the power of God. But to the philosophers, to the scribes, to the Pharisees, to the scholars, it is foolishness. How can a Messiah die in the cross? And so what does the Apostle Paul say? The Apostle Paul says God did it deliberately. He, he, he deliberately chose the cross so that he might make the wise to stumble. So that he might make the scribes to stumble. So that he might make them a, a, a stumble because to them them, this message is an obscure message. Brethren, to us who are being saved, the message of the cross, it is the power of God. Through the cross, we are saved. Christ lost it all in the cross and he gained it all with his resurrection. And the power of this message of the cross is that Jesus did not stay in the grave. He arose. He arose and he arose. Hallelujah. Praise uh, the, the fact that Jesus arose.
rose from the dead. So I would like us with that in mind to, 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 to partake of, of the bread in remembrance of the fact that God used the most neglected way of dying in order for the scholars and the rabbinic Jews and the scribes not to figure it out. But we have figured out that the power of the cross is salvation unto those who believe. May God bless us as we partake of the emblems. Let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for, for the message of the cross. We thank you, Father, that through this message, we, we found salvation, Lord. We know, Father, to the scholars, uh, to the Jews, those who expected you to save them through conquering other nations, those who expected the Messiah to be an all-conquering Messiah, this message was obscured from them. But it was revealed to us who believe that you can use even the neglected things in order to save us. And Father, we believe in this message of salvation. We believe in the finished work of Christ in the cross, that through the cross, our sins were, were, were abolished. We thank you, Father, for this, and we pray that as we partake of the, the bread that symbolizes the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, we might do it in such a way that we will honor you. We pray all this in the name of our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for the blood that was shed on the cross so that, Father God, we might have a relationship with you. Our Lord, our God, you are a good God. You are a great God. You've used neglected things in order to give us life. Father, we know that there is life in the blood and we have attained that life and not only just life, but eternal life. We praise you. And we ask you, Lord, to help us and, and bless us, Father, at this time as we partake of this emblem which represents the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's partake of the fruit. hope we were all able to partake of the fruit of the vine and um, let's proceed to the next segment of our our lord's table when you read second corinthians chapter 8 uh, verse 12 uh, it, it, it is a very revolutionary concept of giving you know sometimes as god's people we think god is an unreasonable god but when you read verse 12 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we see that God is a reasonable God. Listen to what he says. For if the readiness is present, if the eagerness is present, our gifts are acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. God will not... Uh, look at us during this, this difficult time and, and expect things that we do not have. Actually, the biblical idea of giving is that of giving according to how you have been prospered. God knows what you are going through. God also knows what he has blessed you with even in the midst of this uh, trying times and God expects you to give exactly what you have, not what you do not have. And, 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 and this is a service where we need to display the highest uh, level of honesty because we, we cannot lie to God. God knows exactly what we have. He knows what we do not have. So God is not an unreasonable God. He will not ask us to do this service if he knows very well that we can't. But the temptation is great, church. 
during this time for us to be locked in our survivalist mode to think let me save so that if the struggle and the storm prolongs i will be able to still have something but god knows what we have and god knows what he has blessed us with and don't lose the faith you may lose things but keep your faith and keep the trust that you have in our lord and savior jesus so let's not give uh, uh, in a dishonest way let us give what god has given us and so that concludes our lord's table and may god help us to give the way he has blessed us i'll now give an opportunity for those who have apps to use them uh, and give towards the the lord's work and if you um, not a member at, at Hilltop, feel free to give to your own congregation because the work there must still continue. We are one body and we need to continue to do the work of the Lord wherever we are. So we are supportive of the work wherever you are. Alright, let's continue with our uh, study uh, because we have a few verses to go through. Uh, we, 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 will, we will do exactly that. When you read 1 Timothy chapter 3, we are still talking about deacons here. And if there's one thing I want to emphasize from last week's session on deacons, I, I want to suggest that yes, uh, we must not uh, look down on, on, on deacons and the important role that they have in the church. Because when you look at the requirements for becoming a deacon, they are not that different from the requirements of being an elder. So even with deacons, the standard is high. God wants us to hold them to the highest standards. But having said that, I, I don't want you to uh, be obscure or to have an obscure view of things and uh, to think that deacons are more important than elders or to think that their role is more important than elders because we know scripturally that uh, the role of, of elders is still by far uh, the role of taking care of our spiritual life. Although I'm pushing for us not to downplay the role of deacons and, and take them seriously, but I'm also equally saying, let's remember that God has given elders a greater role, uh, which is to take care of our souls. So that's the first point I want to make uh, on that. The second point I, I made last week and that I feel I need to re-emphasize is that uh, we do not start appointing elders and, when the pro and deacons when the process starts. But we, we start looking at them from now. Uh, it starts now for us as Hilltop. We might appoint our deacons and elders maybe in five years' time. But already now we need to be thinking about that process. Even as members of the church, we need to be on a leadership development track. All of us must, must, must be on a leadership development track. And number two, we need to start now, church, to, to, to inform uh, certain men that we think can become deacons now, now, so that they can begin to see that the scrutiny is on them, that we will be analyzing every move they make and, and not to destroy them, but to, to see if they can be suitable for becoming a, a deacon. So, because that's the sense I'm getting when I read this letter. You don't let them know uh, when you are appointing, but you let them know, you give them plenty of time way in advance and you tell them and you let them know well in advance that we will be looking at you, we will be scrutinizing you, uh, and, and, and we will be will be you know holding you to the highest standards and number two you tell them that 
uh, you, you give them greater responsibilities. I think that's what I got from last week's study. Give them greater responsibilities now so that you can see their level of competence. By the time we elect these deacons, we must have seen their competence. They must have demonstrated what they are competent in. So, so occasionally at Hilltop, you'll find me and Brother Chris and other leaders, you know, approaching certain individuals and telling them that, you know, man, we think, you know, you, you might make a great deacon one day. And, and, and so we, we begin to give them responsibility so that we can see them fulfilling those responsibilities. So that is the second point I have from last week's presentation that I think we need to emphasize um, to, to, to the brethren. But also, it's not only the deacons that we put to the test, it's also their wives. Uh, sisters, all of us in the church are in a leadership track. It's not only the guys that will be scrutinized, even their wives, those that they intend to marry in the future or those that they are married to. So this scrutiny goes both ways. It also goes to the wives of deacons. If you want to be a deacon, uh, uh, it must be a family decision, you know. You must let your wife know, you know, that the church is also looking uh, not only at you, but also at her. And, and listen to what the Apostle Paul is saying. So, so sisters, the standard is also high for you too. Uh, you can also disqualify your husbands from becoming uh, deacons and disqualify yourselves uh, from being wives of deacons. Listen to what uh, the Apostle Paul is about to tell us about uh, deacons. He says in verse 11, women must likewise be dignified. You remember the word likewise? In other words, uh, in the same way we hold males to the highest standards, we will also hold their wives to the highest standard. And the word that he uses is gunaikas, and gunaikas is not a uh, deaconess. Uh, some people have suggested that he's talking about deaconesses. You know, there are male, female deacons. No, that's not what he's saying. The word gunaikas is specifically used in the New Testament to refer to women, to wives. Actually, the uh, correct translation is not women. The correct translation is wives must likewise be dignified. In other words, be worthy. They must command respect. They must not be malicious gossips. They must not be people who slander other people, who say things about other people that are not true. The, the, the wives of deacons must also be of good temperament, you know, but they must be temperament. In other words, these are people who are not hot-tempered. These are not people who are likely to lose their temper willy-nilly. The wives of deacons must be must exercise what we call emotional intelligence. You know, they must realize that the other brethren are are looking at them. They must also be faithful in all things. That that's what they need to bear in mind. So sisters, if you are here and your husband is on that leadership track, uh, realize that you also have a responsibility to play in him becoming a deacon. Uh, verse 13, it says, for those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a high standing and a great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So being a deacon, brethren, is not about recognition per se. Even though here we are told that you will receive recognition. It's not getting recognition because you are a deacon. You become recognized based on your conduct. I think this is what uh, the Apostle Paul is trying to say here. That we only recognize deacons who are of good repute. It's our conduct that makes a deacon a deacon. So you are not a deacon because you've been appointed, but you are a true deacon if you if your conduct is aligned to the office. Of course, the Bible does not use the word office of a deacon, but for a lack of a better word, uh, you are not a deacon just because you have been appointed. 
A true deacon, you'll see him by their conduct. Even their conduct says, this one is a deacon. This is a man who is worth following. This is a man that I can submit to. This is a man that I can um, I can, I can, I can be led by. So, so, so those whom you are going to appoint to be deacon, deacons must also be of good conduct because you are not just uh, recognized in the church because you are a deacon. Uh, some people want recognition. I'm a deacon. No, it's your conduct that will make us recognize that you are indeed a deacon. It says, for those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a high standing or high recognition and look at what else they do if you are a good deacon and you're doing exactly what god wants you to do you will inspire great confidence in the faith of brethren you know and uh, you will make brethren to to be great followers of our lord and savior jesus so that's what i, I wanted to say about verse 13 uh, and, and, and I like uh, uh, the, the fact that, you know, our deacons must also be husbands of but one wife. I think verse 12 says our deacons must be husbands of but one wife. That's part of the conduct. You know, we can't have a deacon who's a player. We can't have a, deacons, a deacon who is, who, who is in an adulterous relationship or who's well known for, for, for adultery. Because I'll tell you why. Why we can't have such a deacon. We can't have such a deacon who is compromised leading God's people. You know, I like a quote that was mentioned by another man. He says, God cannot use a compromised soul to reach out to a compromised world. I've seen a danger. In, in our congregations where brethren appoint men who are not suitable, whose conduct is not suitable, who have girlfriends, and they are deacons. You know what I've, I've noted is that when you go to such a person having, you know, a marital problem, maybe your, your wife or your husband is cheating, do you think that man is going to preside over that session in a partial way, in an objective way, I doubt very much. That is why many marriages are going under because maybe most of our churches, we have leaders, we have deacons who are supposed to help us with problems of adultery who are not able to because they themselves know that they are adulterous people. So God's people, we need to appoint suitable men to become Deacons. You can't go for unsuitable characters. The stakes are too high to make a mistake when it comes to appointing a people who are compromised. May God bless us as we continue with these ideas uh, because these are very important ideas for the church. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I want to thank you, Lord, for, for affording us another opportunity to delve into your word and to and to, to hear from you this morning. Father, we, we have learned great lessons today, Father, that, Father, these storms that come our way are not meant to destroy important things, but usually these storms are meant to destroy these non-essentials, these, these things that we think are important, but only to find that you do not deem to be important. And, Father, I pray for your people who might lose these things, who might lose things that they thought were essentials, but, but really when, 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 when we look into the greater scheme of things, these things are not essentials. They are not what our lives are based on, but we, we know that life is more important. We also know that, Father God, uh, our faith is more important. We pray that as these things might be lost to us, that our faith might not be shipwrecked. In the name of our wonderful Lord, and say that Jesus Christ, we pray all this. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>